All right. Well, thank you very much, Russ, to the NIPSOT board for putting together such an amazing event. Very excited to be here with you today. And I think that Russ is right on target. This is an amazing time after the Memorial Day flood of last year and the tax day flood of this year and the drought of 2011 to discuss this not so simple and very dynamic connection between gray infrastructure, things like uh, pipes and, and hardened detention basins and things like that in our green infrastructure, our ecosystems and wild spaces, both on the periphery of the city and in the city itself, and what that dynamic should be and can be. So with me today, I have three wonderful guests, and this is how we're gonna try to work this. We're gonna go ahead and do the panel discussion um, first uh, for, for a while. We have three wonderful panelists. Then we're gonna have uh, some on roads to action. I don't want to miss that because I'm going to ask our panelists, well, what can you do to get involved either at your house or on a larger scale? Then we're going to go to your, your questions. And your questions are really critical and vital. And so I've asked Russ to kind of give me a heads up with about 20 minutes to go so that we can reserve time for your questions. And, um, and then hopefully uh, these guys will stick around for um, the after period questioning because they're going to they're going to uh, provide an incredible amount of information but we have limited time so hopefully they'll stick around for a minute you can ask them some questions i actually have to run to a school to teach teachers about pocket prairies after this but what i am going to do is i'm going to go ahead and provide russ with a one pager of some of the things we discussed with hyperlinks so you can go to these topics and explore this dynamic between our gray and, and green infrastructure so with that being said, before we introduce the panel, I'm going to show you just a quick video. We may not see the whole thing, but it'll kind of get your brain kind of reacquainted with what Houston, Texas is all about. Do you guys remember that? When Houston became a river again? That was certainly not the first time that downtown had flooded. Um, for those of you in the know, the Katy Prairie has already saved Houston once. They built reservoirs to detain water on the Katy Prairie, ensuring that the horrible flooding in the 20s and 30s didn't force this place off the map. But now, with population growth, with other concerns, we're asked again to to think about how as, human, as a human community, we work with the natural communities, the wildscapes of this area, to get to better human outcomes and better outcomes for wildlife. So what we're gonna do is we, we have three distinguished panelists today. Very uh, happy to say each of these are uh, both my colleagues and my mentors, but also my friends. Um, we have Dr. John Jacob, who is the uh, director of the Texas Coastal Watershed Program. He's the region's foremost authority on wetlands and their protection and is the author of a foundational work called Texas Coastal Wetlands. And it's online for free. It's an incredible resource, and I will send this to you. He's also a founder of Texas Baykeeper, a nonprofit that seeks to advocate for the enforcement of existing wetland mitigation codes. Dr. Jacob earned a PhD in soil science from Texas A&M University. If there are any Aggies out there, you can whoop. All right. Next, we have uh, Ms. January Beavers, Deborah January Beavers, and she's the president and CEO of Houston Wilderness and runs several programs, including the Gulf Houston Regional Conservation Plan, which we'll mention later. The plan is an, a very ambitious attempt to coordinate conservation action for the entire region. And much of her latest work has focused on, speaking of flooding, has, has focused on, 
I'm in my wife's civic, so I hope that does not repeat. Um, a lot of her work recently is in an area that is really critical, which is ecosystem services. So how do you calculate what our green resources are doing for us and how to augment that and pay for that? Uh, Ms. Uh, Deborah earned a JD from the University of Houston Law Center, and uh, we're pleased to have her here today. So if there are any cougars, you can say, go cougs. Go Cougs! Um, and lastly, but not leastly, is Stephen uh, Benino, or Benino, depending on how Italian you're feeling today. And, uh, and he has uh, been a real um, wonderful person to get to know in terms of the thought process, and, and, and uh, Mark mentioned kind of using a scientific lens to make decision making. He's been real uh, informative to me of late. He is uh, heavily involved in a five-year study that is measuring native landscapes and how they absorb floodwaters in comparison to developed sites. Dr. Benigno earned a PhD in restoration and ecology and natural resources manage management from Western Australia University in Perth. Sounds like a big adventure. Very cool. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be both Mission Control and Phil Donahue. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists if they have a need in terms of a PowerPoint that they just let me know. Um, and you're probably wondering, well, what am I doing here talking about this? Well, this is where I work. This is the Katy Prairie. It's, um, as somebody was talking earlier about our population growth, um, Katy, the Katy region, is bigger in population than Pittsburgh. That's right. And it's got one of the highest development rates in the country. So at the Katy Prairie Conservancy, we are immersed in development issues in gray versus green infrastructure. And we are partners with many of the groups that are up on this, on this uh, table. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get to some of the questions. So we're going to start with flooding. If, we, if time allows, we'll get to some of the other issues in the region. If not, I will send you links to that. So one of the things that Dr. Jacob, we'll start with Dr. Jacob first. John, you've been studying something that is really critical. After the flooding events, there, were lots of, there was a lot of finger pointing. Who's to blame? Could Harris County Flood Control do diff uh, things differently in, in all of these things? You've been looking at uh, wetland mitigation in Galveston, the Galveston Bay watershed. Can you tell us, kind of in layman's terms, what you're looking at and what developers are supposed to do and what you're finding they're actually doing? Uh, certainly. So uh, my group, the Texas Coastal Watershed Program, part of uh, Texas A&M University, has been involved in uh, looking at uh, our wetland resources uh, over the years and how well they are mitigated. So mitigated is the term of art that is used uh, for uh, trying to minimize the damage that development uh, brings. So the Clean Water Act is the only um, law that we have that protects habitat. And actually it doesn't protect habitat, but it does indirectly because it protects wetlands. And so if you, if you destroy a wetland, you must uh, repair the damage, so to speak. So we have this idea called no net loss. So you pave over a wetland, either you've got to build another one or you've got to preserve uh, another area, perhaps by uh, improving it so, it so you get some of those uh, functions back. So we've been very interested in, well, are we getting our, our money's worth? Who's, who's watching the shop, uh, so to speak? So we're finding uh, several-ish problems. One is that these wetlands uh, in our area, the ones that, you're, that we're, you see here in terms of the loss are not regulated as they should be. Our uh, local, the, the re wetlands are regulated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and our particular district here does not believe that these wetlands are hydrologically connected to the waters of the U.S., so the waterways like Galveston Bay, for example. And so since they don't recognize, that's sort of the first problem, right? If you don't recognize they're uh, regulated, then, then you won't ask for mitigation because, then, because they don't have to. So we spent a lot of time documenting that loss. This is just from Harris County. Uh, all the colors, red and green, are, are wetlands. Um, and the red ones are, are wetlands that have been destroyed uh, up until 2010. So 1992 was the year that we had the last uh, sort of benchmark study. So we've lost certainly of the, of the, of the freshwater wetlands that I like to refer to as prairie, prairie potholes, we've lost uh, well over 40% uh, uh, here in Harris County. Uh, so that's, 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 and that's, that is detention volume, right? Those wetlands are depressions on the landscape. They hold water. 
they're not holding water anymore, they're not uh, mitigated. So we've looked at you know, the, the uh, regulatory issues, how well are they, are they being regulated, they're not. Uh, when they are regulated, how well are they being mitigated? We've looked at that, and, and very, very few of them actually run through the whole mitigation process. So a whole lot is not even mitigated. So, so bottom line is we're not getting our money's worth in this, in this area, and, and I think I sent you a slide, I don't know if you have it there, but the loss of wetlands in, I believe, I sent you uh, Cypress Creek, where there was just a little bit of flooding uh, right? Okay. All right. I'm glad somebody's paying attention there. Now, I'm not going to say that the loss of these wetlands completely caused the flooding, because flooding would have occurred regardless. If you get 17, 20 inches, the area floods. The area flooded before there were people here. You know, this is that you see that we have valleys, right? They fill up, they flood. But the loss of these wetlands exacerbates things. And it's going, it, it's, it's being lost not in accordance with the, with the intent of the Clean Water Act. So it's a long process, it involves a lot of bureaucracies, but I think this slide is uh, instructive that we, and, and I wanna say here that this is conservative because the, nat the National Wetland Inventory missed about two thirds of the wetlands. So the wetlands that they, that they draw in, most experts will agree that what they draw as wetlands are indeed wetlands, but there's a whole lot that they miss. So the situation is actually, three times as bad as what you see here. So just to bring this into context for the audience, what are we talking about, just back of the napkin calculation or more rigorous, per acre, what do you think some of these prairie wetland complexes can hold in terms of gallons per acre? Well, uh, if, we think of the, if we think of wetland coverage being about 30% in an undisturbed situation, which is about what it is, and the wetlands being six inches deep, then you're talking about a third of an acre foot of, of water, that's our volume, right? An acre feet, I can't quite, I think it's 300,000 gallons, I'm not quite sure, uh, acre feet to gallons, but that's yeah. about right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's about right, okay. So about a third, <laughs> about a third of an acre foot uh, gone. And you know, Harris County only asks for a half an acre foot, right, when you pave something over. So a third of an acre foot is quite significant. Yeah, we're talking about millions of gallons. Mil right? Oh yeah, yeah, millions of gallons over a whole watershed, right. yeah. absolutely, yeah, so yeah. Absolutely. So where do, you, uh, where do you take it from here? And if we know that, and, and to be sure, this is not a uh, us against developers argument. This is a how do we come together as a community and work together. But how do you find uh, a way forward in terms of getting this situation better corrected for? Well, I don't, I don't think we can blame the developers anyway because the developers aren't the ones that set the rules. Right. So developers, when they come into an area, they look for uh, predictability. You know, how is the system going to work? What do I need to do? And so if the uh, permitting agencies aren't asking for mitigation, <laughs> they're certainly not going to provide it. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you have to, you have to write your... Uh, Congressman, I guess, say, hey, why isn't this being looked at? We, the studies are there. a and has done studies. Baylor has done studies uh, showing this connectivity here. Mm -hmm. uh, it may, usually what happens in the wetland arena, it, it, uh, these discussions uh, don't have resolution unless they're done in front of a judge. So, <laughs> which means a lawsuit, right? Which we don't right. like. I, don't, I personally don't like lawsuits to have to deal with them, but, but the bureaucracies tend to you know, be resistant to change. Right. And so it has to come from that way. Now, I'll, since you mentioned Galveston Baykeeper, of which I am the board chair, we just uh, are standing up our organization with a, a nice uh, grant that we'll, we'll be advertising later, but we will have a wetland watch program. And we will be looking for volunteers. Uh, you know, this is, just, this, is, this is just to help point out to the core where development is happening. It's not necessarily an antagonistic thing, but it's we need stewards that are watching the land. And if we're not watching the land, then who, who, who really cares? Right. So please so, contact me if you want to be in part of the Wetland Watch. Right, Eyes so we're going to give everybody, uh, that's a really great segue, John, we're going to give everybody a kind of onwards to action, how you can get involved with some of these things a little bit later on. I think being a wetland watcher for Galveston Bay Keepers is really great. We're going to go ahead and contextualize kind of the, the flood control properties of these wildscapes a little bit by talking to uh, Stephen about 
some research that he's doing on the Katy Prairie and looking at um, how prairies are instrumental in, in saving uh, or storing water and also what he thinks this research might reveal from a practical level. So can you just briefly describe um, kind of the, the study that's going on, when you think it might be done, and where you think it might lead? Yeah, certainly. Um, so <clears throat> this study came apart from a Texas Water Development Board grant, which uh, came to the district to look at the overflow in the Cypress Creek area. So the rainfall and runoff absorption study was just a small part of a larger study to develop uh, con concepts similar to, uh, not quite as extreme as Attics and Barker Reservoir, but something along those lines to uh, retain water before it got to Attics and Barker Reservoir. So I guess the way things are done uh, uh, with development is uh, a, mu a municipal utility district comes in and they develop their own detention piecemeal in little parts. And before a lot of development comes into the area, what the Flood Control District wanted to do with this grant was to have a more regional solution for the area instead of all these little piecemeal detention basins that you see in front of subdivisions that are usually just fountains uh, with a hiking trail around them. So we wanted to bring in a lot more players uh, with a lot more interest in the area. So the rainfall and runoff study was, I guess, built out of the fact that in a lot of other parts of the country, they were able to show that prairie could absorb a certain amount of rainfall. And we wanted to show that it could happen down in this region as well, because a lot of the studies were uh, either they were not really well quantified or they were anecdotal. And some of them were done in different parts of the country, such as Wisconsin, which they have a lot more sandy soils. Uh, the soils are obviously a big uh, uh, influencer in terms of absorption. So we set out uh, to install different rainfall and runoff uh, measurement gauges. This is one of them being right here. And we installed six of them in the Katy Prairie area. We installed two uh, at a coastal prairie, pristine coastal prairie, two in an agricultural uh, ranch land that had been left fallow, and then two in developed land. And this, this equipment here measures rainfall. It measures uh, runoff in a certain sub-basin area. So you measure the amount of water which flows through a set point, this one being a culvert, and it can also measure the groundwater as well. And from this study, you can tell how much rainfall falls in an area and then how much runoff uh, goes through this point. So from a year's worth of data, uh, with the grant study we were in, uh, involved in, we had to report uh, a year's worth of data. And as Jaime mentioned, we are uh, studying this over a five-year period, and we're about three and a half years in. So these numbers right here represent um, one year's worth of data. So we are showing that there is a benefit with the coastal prairie system. So uh, in, in saying that as well, we have to also take into account that this is native prairie, this isn't restored prairie. And what we want to, what we would like to do with this is to have developers, instead of building a detention basin, let's say, they can just restore prairie, a certain acreage of prairie. And, and from this study, we would be able to quantify how many acres they would be able to restore versus how many acres they develop to offset that development. And the question is, one of the bigger questions that I've been trying to find is, from a restored prairie, are you getting the same functional benefits, the same ecosystem services as you are a native prairie? Because you can put the prairie plants back and it might look like a prairie from above ground, but what's happening below ground? If you restore prairie on fallow land that's been compacted, that's been tilled for I don't know how many years, uh, you may not get those same functional benefits. And if you do get those benefits, they may not occur in the time frame that you would like. So from this study, they basically developed two conceptual plans uh, that, would be, that would retain water before they entered in Attics and Barker. And those plans are still under review. They're sort of uh, kicking them around to see if they would be feasible. Something that is coming from this study, hopefully in the near future, I think the next couple months, are retention guidelines for developers as opposed to detention guidelines. And those retention guidelines will retain water for a certain amount of time before it sends it down, before the water gets sent down into Attics and Barker Reservoir. And a part of that retention guidelines is for the, an option for the developers to restore prairie. And there's a, a document that we've been 
developing and kicking around to set out criteria for these developers to restore prairie and it, you have to restore a certain amount of species onto the land and that's kind of up for debate because no one really knows how many species it takes to restore a native prairie that's kind of a almost a subjective question and then also what are your ecosystem services how much of the uh, how much infiltration do you get from a native prairie and if you go to the next slide there is a slide that shows this is the this is what we were able to show in those sites where we had the soil water infiltration right here. You can see just the massive amount. That's considered extremely high. Uh, from the soils around here, it's, it's classified into very high, high, moderate, moderately low, and low. And to get very high soil infiltration rate, you have to have two and a half inches per hour. And so this coastal prairie is incredibly high. But again, it does depend on your soils that you're looking at. I've gone around with a uh, soil infiltration measurement, which is what's going on right here. And I've done the same measurements on soils in the southeast portion of the county where you have more heavy clays. And even though you're looking at native prairie that's been there for, for decades and it hasn't been tilled, because the soils are, are different uh, than the sandy clay loams that you have in the, in the pra uh, Katy Prairie area, you're not getting that absorption. You're still getting very high absorption, but not what you would see here. So uh, this prairie restoration method for flood control benefits may not be applicable everywhere. It's, it might be more of a region-specific solution in tandem with some of the more traditional methods, such as building, building detention basins. Thank you very much, Stephen. So the, the upshot is promise promise that we'll be able to quantify those wildscapes and what they provide. And that's why I'm so excited to have Deborah here today because Deborah's brain, two things. One, she has deep connections with the business community, which is going to be extremely helpful in, in getting wilds, wildscapes protected across the region. Can't do it without the business community fully engaged, but also from the legal aspects as well. So Stephen talked a little bit about this economic prospect of of saving um, large chunks of land, that there might be an economic driver to that. Can you talk a little bit about the regional conservation plan, what it is, and how you hope the business community might buy into it because of ecosystem services? Sure, and before I do that though, I do wanna um, mention that if you have a chance, I'm, I'm not you know, here to, Tout the Houston Chronicle, I think, though I think it's pretty good, but there is actually an, an editorial by the editorial board this morning related to this third uh, area that will benefit Attics and Barker Reservoir um, by creating um, um, a, a way to avoid some of the Cypress Creek runoff that's been going on, the overflow area. Um, this has been going on in, in our world for a long time, talking about it from the environmental conservation point of view and with Harris County Flood Control District, but it is finally now uh, beginning to get some attention in the media and more and more people are aware that we need this, this third overflow area. And of course that overflow area, while it will likely include some levees, to a, to a large extent is touting uh, uh, restoration of the coastal wetlands as part of that and the prairie system as, as part of the solution. So it's getting out there into mainstream media and we're excited about that. So if you have a chance to see that, um, if I'd thought about it, I would have, I would have brought one. But uh, anyway, it's in today's paper, so it was really timely. Uh, yes, about two and a half years ago, the environmental and governmental community came together with some large business interests, uh, some oil and gas companies and um, uh, developers and engineers to talk about a way to create the first ever regional conservation plan. The idea uh, being that to have all the major conservation, uh, really uh, major and minor conservation and environmental related projects uh, in one place where we could then look at connectivity, create vision maps, uh, talk about how uh, th the business community, governmental community and environmental community could come together uh, to uh, enhance uh, mitigation efforts, enhance uh, large landscape and pocket prairie areas, estuaries, pretty much everything in our eight county area. And we chose the eight county area uh, because we wanted to be able to put, not only for ourselves, to be a, a put some kind of limit on how many projects 
uh, were out there and, and ways to connect them, but also uh, by creating it as an eight county effort, we brought in three major watersheds uh, in addition to the, I mean, three major rivers in addition to the 22 major watersheds in the area. We felt like that was a good start. Uh, so it wasn't to leave anybody out, but it was just to find a way to, to have some kind of limits on what we were talking about. Uh, and I'll show some websites later that'll let you get more information on this. But if you could show the 10 ecoregions real quick, uh, map, I think it's right before this one. So you all, some of you all may know all, all this, some of you may not, but we have 10 distinct ecoregions in the greater Houston area, seven land-based and three water-based. We have a lot. We've got a lot of diversity. We have a lot, some, you might almost say overwhelming amount of, of ecology to look at, but um, I'm a very half, uh, water half full kind of a person. And so the, the benefit to this much is that we have a tremendous amount of uh, environmental interest and environmental groups working on a variety of aspects of, of all of this. Over 100 really environmental based groups are in this region. So if we can go back to the, to the, to the what I call the regional conservation plan or RCP map. Uh, so, but with 10 eco regions, again, if you want to really create a vision map of what we're dealing with here, uh, so that you can help the business community and policymakers and others really be able to uh, compare green infrastructure with gray infrastructure, you need to have something that's a little bit easier to put one's arms around. So with a group of uh, 20 plus uh, major environmental groups in the region, well, it includes everyone uh, on this stage, uh, we, we have a steering committee and that steering committee came up with this vision map of the eight county region with uh, four major eco areas, as we call them. And then the 10 eco regions are within these four areas. The Northern Forest, the Galveston Bay and Gulf system, the prairie system, or I mean, the bio riparian zone, which is significantly prairie system, and the Columbia Brazos corridor, which follows, follows the Brazos River. The other two major rivers, the uh, San Jacinto and the Trinity are incorporated into uh, the other three eco areas. Within this, uh, plan uh, are hundreds of projects that are in need of either full or partial funding. And these are all divided into two phases. Phase one is land acquisition and nature-based trails. And phase two is pretty much everything else. So uh, if projects are strictly restoration uh, uh, or you know other aspects of environmental work that are not land acquisition or nature-based trail related or conservation easement related, they go into phase two. In phase one, if you, uh, in, work, in working with uh, the, the larger planning group, which is any and everybody interested in the, in the regional conservation plan, we know that of the projects that are out there that are in essence shovel ready, that if they had the funding they could move forward would be acquisition of 300,000 additional acres of land. Similar to what John was saying, you've got to have the land in order to be able to restore it, so it's a, it's a significant priority and uh, then 15,000 acres of land uh, easements and 250 miles of recreational uh, nature-based trails. And as I said, phase two is um, uh, everything else. I wanna show you a few numbers real quick on uh, where this is over the last two and a half uh, years. Again, the great thing about having all the projects in one place is you can quantify it and you can show what's going on. And we have an interactive map and a, on a website where whether you're a business or you're an a resident or you're an, uh, an environmental group or whoever you might be, if you are interested in a particular area and you wanna know what's going on in terms of environmental work, you can now look at this map to have an idea of what the projects are that are out there going on. Uh, in the initiative, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, under the Regional Conservation Plan, you have to have a way to look at all these projects. You've heard about phase one and phase two, but within the phase one and phase two, we have five major initiatives. Every single project falls into one of those five initiatives. Uh, this is, shows you all the projects just for phase one of those five initiatives. The, uh, the blue color, and I think you can see this pretty well, but the darker blue color is the Headwater to Baywater Initiative, and that is uh, kind of what it sounds like. It's projects that are along our riparian waterways, or riparian areas and waterways, uh, that you know are, are projects related to land acquisition, easements, or nature-based, uh, some nature-based trails, although they really come into play with the dark, more purple color, the Bio Greenway Initiative. It's a significant amount of that 250 plus 
recreational miles. And you might be wondering, well, tra trail development and, and restoration and you know, native plants and everything we're talking about today, how does that really fit in? Well, uh, if you're not from this area, you may not know. Most folks from this area do know now, but creating trails along our biosystems has turned out to be a huge uh, benefit, not just from pe purposes of recreation and getting our community out into the nat natural areas in our community, but a way for the community to really support what's going on in those areas. So they begin to notice when trees are being cut down, good or bad, and you know we have to work on education to explain what those differences are. But uh, they, uh, the community is really taking much more interest and ownership in these waterways and these areas because for the first time they can see them and get near them and walk by them and you know and and bike etc so the nature-based trails are, is a big deal it's a little bit different component but with it is the opportunity to talk about restoration and uh and uh, uh and land protection for purposes of flooding and th those type of of issues and then the other three real quick are the oyster reef migratory bird habitat initiative which you know was not really a topic for today i won't go into that too much the Galveston Habitat Acquisition and Easement Initiative, and then the Prairie Conservation Initiative, which is hugely apropos for today's discussion. And you'll see where those are. Those are the yellow. You can get an idea of where those are. Those are some of the key areas that the environmental and governmental communities have said need major land acquisition uh, easements uh, put into place, restoration efforts. Sometimes these are actually pristine uh, uh, prairies that need to be captured before they're developed, that kind of thing. So let me, let me ask, because uh, we are getting close to the time where we're going to talk to people about what they can do to interact with this. So, you know, John talked about some of the challenges of working uh, in the regulatory realm. So if we want to stay a really great wildlife habitat, there's a lot of legal and business and economic and scientific concerns that have to, those, those places just don't show up on their own. There's a lot of underwork at the 30,000 foot level. Stephen talked about some of the science that's providing kind of the impetus to, to know that we have ecosystem services and quantifiable ecosystem services. And then Deborah talked about this willingness for the conservation community to work hand in hand. I think a lot of that is spurred on by the tremendous amount of development in the area. All the groups need to work together and we recognize that. So let me ask this question before we go to, to uh, kind of on ramps for action. Anybody can pick this up. Where do you feel the temperature is in terms of public officials, regulatory agencies, and the folks that kind of control coding and, and what really happens in the city in terms of using more green infrastructure out in the rural areas or in the city and in terms of climate change? Um, you know, we haven't talked a lot about climate change, but it's going to greatly impact the amount of flooding droughts and other things that we have coming uh, our way. In fact, let me just show you just a real quick uh, slide that kind of, as, a, as an ecologist, I, this just uh, gives me some pause. Um, so this slide kind of shows you a little bit about some of the projections in terms of temperature increase and also in terms of sea level rise. But one of the last ones down here is a, is a naturalist, and I think any birder, and Glenn Olson's probably in here, he can tell you this. We, we know climate change is happening because the birds are telling us. We're seeing birds that are so far out of range uh, consistently now. Um, and over a 30, 40 year period, if you look at the Christmas bird count data, it's just stunning. It's happening. If you, you know, John was talking about Galveston Baykeeper. If you kayak Galveston Bay, the amount of mangroves growing in Galveston Bay is stunning if you haven't seen it. So where do you think Houston is positioned? It seems like there's a, there's a park revolution and we're reaccepting our green spaces in the city, but where do you find the temperature in terms of large scale wildscape conservation and where Houston wants to position itself in regards to other cities? And anybody can take that. Good okay, well, I'll just jump right in then while you figure it out. Um, well, I think I believe the temperature is rising, not just for the climate change, but the temperature of people in this city who are interested in the green infrastructure and the native area, the natural areas that surround us. I believe that is, is growing, that there's a greater uh, predisposition from just regular folks, citizens, interested in the fact that there's prairies, there's forests, et cetera, 
and, and certainly in the business community, and I hope, Deborah, you'll, you'll speak to that. So, so I have, uh, you know, I've been here working for a good 20 plus years. Uh, I have high hopes that, that, that this can become much more of an issue. Um, but you know, unless it does, you know, we can, there's, you can only ask so much of the regulatory communities. I mean, they'll kind of do what they need to do. But if people are complaining, if they're writing letters to the editor, if they're out making sure that people are aware that, yeah, these prairies are there, we know what's there. It's on our watch, folks, that we're going to lose the best of what's left. You saw that map. Maybe you should just put that ecologic map right up there again. It's actually in the urban peripheral area where we have the greatest amount of undisturbed prairie potholes, of forests in relatively decent uh, uh, condition. We didn't map out beyond that, but once you get out, say, into, into Wharton County and others, they have some good habitats left. But for the most part, that was just massively lost to agriculture. So we have a great endowment that is still here. I mean, it's, it's significant. There are hundreds of thousands of acres of relatively undisturbed, okay, let's say never plowed anyway, okay? Nothing's perfect, nothing's pristine, but there's stuff that's out there that we can preserve, and it's on our watch, especially the younger people here, but even the folks a little bit long in the tooth like myself. You take a piece like, like the Damon Prairie, there are 70,000 acres of continu continuous, not just contiguous, but continuous unland leveled areas, some of them with tremendous uh, uh, germplasm left in both what's called the Nash Prairie and the Mowatney Prairie. A lot of it has been trampled over quite a bit. Uh, but there are very significant pieces. So we can't, we can't just kind of throw up our hands and say, oh, well, most of it's gone. No. Yeah, well, most of it has gone, but a whole lot remains that is worth our best efforts, is worth your best efforts, folks like you that are interested in native plants in our area, in the nature of our area. There is plenty for us to do. So Deborah, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna redirect that last question before we get to kind of on-ramps for action. Um, John was talking about the tremendous potential. What is the cost if we don't save these areas in terms of global competitiveness? Right, well, and if we can show the, the services provided by, if you have that one real quick the, with the check marks. Uh, Jaime mentioned that uh, Houston Wilderness working with a variety of scientists and other groups, including uh, John, uh, uh, put together an ecosystem services primer that looks at um, some of the top ways to analyze based upon what goal you have in mind, what the value of ecosystem services are. And the, the cost is, is, of course, in the, in the billions of uh, the loss that takes place when we lose a lot of these not only pristine areas, but also don't um, have the ability for whatever reason to um, restore areas that could slowly but surely uh, uh, work its way back to um, creating some significant ecosystem services. Uh, so these are three of, the, of those four eco areas that I mentioned. Uh, the wetlands and estuaries, and these are ecosystem services for our area, but I, you know, they're somewhat universal, as you might imagine. But I um, mean, look at the difference in the, um, and what, when we lose prairies, for instance, we're losing ecosystem services related to water supply, water quality, uh, erosion control, flood protection, air quality, carbon sequestration, recreation and habitat. I mean, we're losing a lot. We're losing a lot more than, than oftentimes is really explained to the public. It's not just a piece of land. I know this audience knows that. Uh, but what's beginning to happen is that the business community is really beginning to recognize that, that their bottom line is affected if they don't provide opportunities to either um, help um, uh, hold on to some of those ecosystem services related to areas that maybe they're developing or maybe where they wanted to get some mitigation credits or whatever the case might be. Uh, but also that in sometimes they actually want to try to enhance, go beyond whatever their particular footprint might be. And if I could real quick, also the gray versus green infrastructure slide. This is what the, as, as this um, slide I use when I talk uh, just specifically about valuation of ecosystem services. But when you look at the difference between a value of a gray infrastructure item, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, a wastewater treatment plan or whatever the case might be. Sometimes that's the answer. But what the business community across the board is recognizing is that the, ben the multiple benefits and oftentimes the cheaper option of a gray infrastructure uh, uh, type of development 
far outweighs the gray infrastructure. And that, we're not, I wouldn't say we're at the tipping point, but we're getting there. And there's a lot of uh, discussion going on in our community about it. And uh, when you really start to put some of those numbers together of the, again, the multiple values of land and what it's providing in terms of those ecosystem services, it's, it's, it just far outweighs um, whatever the gray infrastructure item is that maybe was going to be put in its place. And what I'm going to do with the one pager that I'm going to send you is we're going to, if you, for those of you who want to take a deep dive, one of the hyperlinks you're going to get is the primer that uh, Houston Wilderness put together in terms of calculating how much these eco services provide for us. And so you can make a back calculation on what we're going to miss out. One of the things that I will say in terms of the benefit of green infrastructure, it's not captured here, although this is an excellent list, is um, a sense of where you live in the world and civic pride. Hard to calculate that, but I just came from Boulder, where it is, you know, and every time I said Houston, the reaction was, you make a noise that describes that. <laughs> right? So that's changing, and I think that John is, is right. I think that there's something in the air that's making us reevaluate. Maybe it's because Houston's a teenage city going into adulthood. We're trying to figure out how much history do we need? How much green space do we need? This shouldn't just be a disposable place, right? So I think that what I'm going to do is ask you guys, just very quickly so we can get to questions, what's one thing that these folks, these regular folks out in the audience can do? This is a very 30,000 foot level discussion, but there are some practical things that they can do in order to help that green infrastructure grow and be saved. What's one thing that you would advise these folks to do? Wow, there's so many. <laughs> I guess, you know, not as many people are as environmentally minded as we are, and just to spread the word, educate other people, not just on the intrinsic aesthetic benefits of these plants, but also the, the ecosystem services they provide, put it into more of a broader concept and let people know that the other, other benefits uh, that these, that these uh, you know, native plants can, can provide going to go in a row. Uh, I, you know, I think um, there are a variety, and it's hard for my head to um, settle on one, but I, I th I'm going to mention a little bit of what was talked about earlier when the question was asked about understanding the difference between or being able to recognize more the difference between our native plants and our invasives. Uh, and particularly as you all and very soon here, I guess, look at um, uh, purchasing these native plants. I think the more that we have events like this and we uh, and, and we start to understand what those differences are and we're able to, uh, to, to plant those natives and avoid those invasives, I think it's, it's huge. And it's, um, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the business community and large landscape areas that are generally owned by environmental nonprofits and governmental entities. But these residential areas, and Jaime talks a little about this a lot, they're key. There's a lot more of those than there are of the others. So. Um, you know, getting the, getting the native plants in and removing the invasives is a biggie. Well, let me say uh, first, before I get to the last, <laughs> uh, I'm definitely all in favor of the ecosystem services idea, but I want to just clarify with one thing, and that is that there is a whole lot more that we don't know about these areas than we can know, and not only that we can know, that we will ever know. There's a whole lot more about it, what happens in a prairie pothole in a prairie soil in terms of the ecology and, and the soil food there that we will never know. And so we can never quantify these things completely. And so there is some reason to think about and to say, yeah, well, these need to be preserved regardless. So as I said, that we can't imagine, but I guess the one thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to use your imagination and to imagine what this place would look like, surrounded by vibrant, live native prairies, by forests that are functioning and that are wonderful and beautiful places, and that we can love to call home and say, yes, this is our place. This is where we live, okay? So you've got to get involved. You need to find out, you know, what about wetlands? What about forests? What's going on, okay? So I'm just going to be totally uh, ruthless here and unashamed and promote this new organization that's just standing up. It's been around, but it's standing up, Galveston Baykeeper, uh, because we will be out looking at the wetlands and the prairies and the forests. Because if you're not talking about them, if you're not out bringing this up, then everybody, you know, who's here to mourn the loss of the Damon Prairie? 
Who will cry when the prairie's gone? Okay? There's no replacing that prairie. There's no, there's no mitigation. There's no no net loss that can make up for that and many other places. So, you know, that's the call to you. Use your imagination and join the cause. All right, super. We're ready for, for questions from the audience. I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you very much to our panel. How about that? No, we just got a big yeah. You can see why they're such great mentors to me. And I have uh, two other mentors that I wanted to mention just real quickly. Uh, Mark Kramer, uh, my Prairie Yoda. Uh, he just means so Everybody's much to Everybody's Prairie Yoda, right? That's right. So much to the, to the environmental community, period, and uh, particularly to me. And I, I really thank him for his years of service. And also Carol Hulbig, uh, who's in the audience, who didn't think I'd call her out today. But Carol is somewhere. And they're going to be putting in a prairie pocket prairie at Unitarian Universalist Church uh, this, this month, which is great. And John talked a little bit about the moral dimensions of why we do what we do. I think it's really critical. Um, and she's the one who taught me how to be a teacher. So you can thank her if, if, uh, if you've enjoyed any of my classes. So with that, audience questions. With the um, bringing the flooding and wetlands down to the home level, um, I'm getting ready to attempt a uh, rain garden and swale to increase retention on my property. And I was just wondering if there were just kind of some general kind of um, tips on how do you do that within your neighborhood, kind of like being the friendly neighborhood that people look at you and like, okay, so you're putting in this ditch. <laughs> you know, I mean, trying to landscape it properly, but just if there are any just kind of suggestions before I go and make a big mess. <laughs> yeah. Let, me, let me just say real quick, um, that question is being asked by just about every you know, major um, group right now, I'd say, in the Houston region. And I was recently talking to the state biologist for US Fish and Wildlife. It's actually being, say, being asked statewide, and there is a Houston Wilderness does a lot of convening and we're conv and problem solving and we're with the large environmental governmental community and we're in the midst right now of creating some documents with the scientists and experts in the area to try to answer that question in a way that um, really helps people practically figure out how to make this work. So your question's a great one uh, and I'd love today to be able to say here's the list but we're working on trying to really create something to do that. And, and Jaime may want to go into more detail, but it's a great question. Um, I took my Texas A&M hat off, by the way, when I was in the last question there, just so you know. <laughs> you put your you halo can. on. And That's right, yeah. Hat. But I'll put my university hat back on to address that, because the extension system does have a whole lot of information mm -hmm. on these kind of things. In fact, we're putting some workshops on. It's called Gutter to Gator believe it or not. There's one that's going to go on. I think it's in uh, Galveston later this month, but if you look at, at our website. So I, I think it is important to do the kinds of things that you're doing, but at the same time, we need to, I think, uh, let me just throw a note of caution in here because it's a question of scale. So what you do will be valuable and will help to infiltrate there. And But I think, because I see in the, in the news sometimes and, and some of these uh, pieces in the paper, you know, that, well, if we just put a rain garden in, we're not going to flood anymore. If we get 20 inches of rainfall, if we get 40 <laughs> inches of rainfall, folks, your rain garden ain't going to make any difference, okay? <laughs> now, if you get a one inch or a one and a half inch or a two inch, maybe even, but certainly a one inch, sure, it can make a difference and it can improve the water quality, no question about it. So I think we just need to keep these things because I see, especially when we get these big floods, and people, you know, we got to do something. Well, rain gardens aren't going to solve Meyerland's problems, right? I think we can know that, yeah. right? If you build in a floodplain, you are rolling the dice. And uh, they've, uh, they've been coming up, uh, winning the several times. So let's definitely do that. But let's just remember to, you know, there's green infrastructure on your, on your lawn, and there's green infrastructure in the prairie, right? And so I, I have native grass. I'm building a native vegetation myself in my yard. But let's, we've got to save the daymen. Yeah. Oh, wait, we got one here. Wait a minute. We got one right here. 
Did we you got them all over um, the place. Yes. Uh, so I live in the, I have lived in Spring area, and I moved there, my family moved there in 72, and it was pretty much a two-lane road on 1960. Now everybody pretty much knows what, what it looks like um, at this point. Um, and when I traveled north on 45, there were forests. And I thought we were getting smarter, like you're all saying, we're being uh, more aware of the environment. And, and with your check checklist, the forests have, everything is checked, the benefit. Right, yeah. How is it, um, and I think everybody, even builders are aware of the benefits of forest, how come we're allowing, and it still happens, I drive up there now, and places that have been pristine since 72 are clear, are just cleared now. Why, can, what can we do? Who do we notify? Is there, I mean, I just, I cry, literally, when I go up there and see the forests, just clear cut. Let's, let's let that provide a few answers. Yeah, well, I guess as far as, uh, you know, the flood control district is concerned, it's um, people buy and develop the land all the time, and unfortunately you can't, stop development in some areas aside from getting an organization to purchase that land and holding it under a conservation easement or some other form of, of uh, uh, legal way to do that. And for uh, the, there are developer guidelines that are in place in terms of flood control. And what that states is that you, know, you, you can't build in a 100-year floodplain and you cannot increase the amount of water that leaves the land that you develop. So when they develop, they're supposed to follow those two guidelines. And the issue with, I guess, all, all the flooding that has been occurring is that their development occurred a long time ago, and there wasn't a lot of information in terms of exactly what a 100-year flood was and where the floodplains are. Uh, those are always changing as we get more data. Um, maybe. A, 20 inch rainfall has never occurred in one area before, so we didn't know the extent of how much it would flood in that area versus another area of the county. But in terms of uh, your question of how to stop developers from going in and, and developing that land, uh, that, that's, that's a good question. And just gathering a lot of support behind you and, and <laughs> Chaining yourself to a tree? Can I, can I take, <laughs> can I take a, let me take a, a gander at that? Oh, you want to? And uh, well, real quickly. And, uh, and that's where, for instance, the regional conservation plan, at least in the eight county area, which includes quite a bit of the northern forest, uh, is helpful because we can, we, we can show the, you know, everybody right now on an interactive map where at least there are areas that are targeted for protection of certain lands. And then also, because everybody's now much more connected to each other, we can, in fact, this is happening in some areas, including the Northern Forest, where they're now saying, here's some area that we know is open to potential development. We can come together and, and maybe create a collaborative a grant or other type of project where they can target saving some of that uh, area. And then the other thing is we really try to promote the good corporate steward uh, where they do buy land, but they do try to keep a lot of what is there. So, and there is some of that happening in the Cypress Spring Creek area, thank goodness. And so we really want to highlight and tout, you know, the good going on uh, to maybe lessen perhaps um, uh, more of that um, clear cutting type of behavior. But we're not done. We've got a got ways to go. I, before John yeah. says it, I'll say it. <laughs> well, just, yeah, I mean, you know, what was the Margaret Mead statement? Never underestimate what a, you know, a committed group of people can do, okay? So if you're watching and you're crying, crying is good. That gets you started, okay? Okay, we've got to mourn, but then you've got to stand up and say, okay, who else is out here? Who else is concerned about this? And people have to come together. You know, whether you have to chain yourself to the tree, I don't know, but you've certainly got to, and you're not going to save it all, you know, like what Deborah was saying here, but there are some areas that are more interesting than others, so you need to educate yourself. Well, which areas are those? Yeah. Lake Creek is a critical area, okay? There's other areas that are critical. You know, which ones are we going to save? So, but that's people at your level coming together, getting together, talking about it, what are the alternatives, and just creating that awareness because there are some developers that are wanting to be good stewards, and if somebody's raising a lot of hell, they might avoid that area. Well, also, I didn't know, I didn't think of this earlier, but the great example of the Deer Park 
prairie of people coming right. together and saving that location. So that's that's a very good yep, case right there. One more question. One more. Are the maps used in this uh, section available on a website to view? I'm going to send you, let me uh, address that. I'm going to go ahead and send you a resource page that will outlink to a lot of what you saw today because a lot of it's on the web like the regional conservation plan. I will say just in closing real quick, two things. One is uh, that pressure from beneath, which is what, what John is talking about, and grassroots efforts are critical. Pressure from, not pressure, but encouragement from above in terms of all the regulatory and legal, and especially the conservation groups being united right now in terms of looking at funding is going to be really critical. And that's because I can't wait till my two-year-old grows up to save this stuff. I really do, and John and others believe I think we got about a 10-year window to save the, the rest of the best. That's it. It'll be gone. And so we're going to have to, as a conservation community, get incredibly creative very quickly and do a lot of different things that we have never done before. That's the only way we're going to make it, I think. And I think that the RCP is a really good start to that in binding people together. Now we're going to see where it goes next. I will also say this. We're going to have to calculate properly ecosystem services and what they mean, even though we don't know them all. And that's why I would also like to encourage any of you who can make it to this conference, which is going to be at University of Houston downtown. Many, of, many ecologists are working on this. But we recognize that if it, we're just talking to the green people and the nature nerds like us, and I mean that in a very good way, <laughs> that we are never going to raise to the level that we need to in terms of public consciousness. So at this conference, this is an interdisciplinary conference. We're going to be there with politicians and developers and health officials and social justice advocates and transportation planners because we need to be playing not just within the environmental community, but we need to be dealing with all these other people who impact conservation. So it's going to be UHD. It's going to be very dynamic, a lot of different people. You talk about heads exploding. Last year at the People in Nature conference, it was amazing. And none of these people had ever talked to each other. They're making decisions that impact each other. So also reach out to somebody that, like John was saying, and Stephen was saying, that doesn't know what you're talking about and you'll probably find some common cause. With that, I'd like to thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch, and I will go ahead and send you these resources next week.